All right, well, we're going to get started, and as people trickle in, they can just join us where we are. But we wanted to start with a few questions. We're just kind of wondering who here has used, uses VMware SD-WAN or SASE services today? OK, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, and how many of you use the API today? OK, all two or three of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully by the end of this presentation that you guys understand the value of the APIs and are as enthusiastic as we are about the possibilities present with them. Now, uh, this might not be as uh, exciting as hearing about disaggregated storage or multi-cloud uh, security services, but I hope you enjoy it all the same. Uh, I'm Adam Logan, despite the button-up shirt. I am, in fact, the senior so staff software engineer here at VMware. I've been here about six and a half years. And I'm Lily Schneiderman. I'm a software developer on Adam's team, and I've been with VMware for just about a year now. Uh, our favorite slide, the required disclaimer. Uh, I'll give you one second to one. OK. <laughs> um, so uh, Lily and I are part of the business intelligence team uh, in the SASE Center of Excellence. Um, don't, call, don't ask me why we're called the Center of Excellence. We just are. Uh, and we are, in fact, excellent. So um, our project uh, really started from the need of our business to really better understand our deployments and our customers' deployments. Uh, everyone in our business unit, from sales all the way through product, uses the, the data and the information that we provide. Um, the sales team, for instance, will use our data in uh, processing your renewals, uh, looking at how many edges you have, uh, what their bandwidth is configured at, or how much you've consumed in bandwidth. Um, our support team will try and notify you when you're breaking best practices, or potentially when uh, you have um, you have the potential to hit a, a bug that we know about. And our product team will dive in and really measure what features you're using across uh, all of our deployments. Um, as far as our, our sh the short version of our agenda goes, um, the first thing we're going to do is show you how we how we in VMware use and visualize the data. And then we're going to show you how we gather that data. And finally, how you benefit from that data today. Um, Lily's going to lead us off here with um, how we use the data today. All right, thanks, Adam. So one of the most impactful questions we try and answer is, how is my network doing? While you can log into the orchestrator and look at each site individually, this isn't really feasible for a large network all at once. In this session, we want to show you how some of these questions can be answered. We hope that by demonstrating how we answer these questions, that you'll walk away with an appreciation for the vast APIs available, the value of mapping the data into something consumable, and how from this data, we're able to pull useful and actionable insights. When we added up all of the data points we analyze each year, we realized it is a huge number. Over 4.5 trillion data points across roughly 18,000 customers and hundreds of thousands of edges. From this, we are faced with the issue of how do you consume this amount of data? How do you analyze it or drill down into potential problems? How do we ensure all the different users that Adam mentioned are supported? How do you turn trillions of data points into actionable insights? One of the ways we're able to piece together narratives with all of this data is by pulling insights into our customers. From our customer data, we're able to answer where are our customers located, what industry are they in, how big are they, and even what's their revenue. Questions like these provide a lot of value. Looking at industry use cases could drive the buy decisions for future enterprises, or could help us understand the scope of certain industries. Overall, the important takeaway is that we collect data across a vast number of verticals, across an even vaster customer base. Thus, our data and insights should be relevant and useful to a wide range of use cases, including you all here. Another way we're able to pull insights and piece together narratives from the API data is by looking into customer networks and asking that big question of, how is my network doing? 
it's really important when we ask this question to be able to look at the network as a whole. A common issue for any network administrator is to deal with performance problems. Everyone likes to blame the network. There are many metrics you can look at that drive performance. In the top, we can see CPU and memory consumption of the edge. Down below that, we have link and overlay utilization. We could ask, are the links overloaded? Maybe the traffic load is starting to exceed the edge's capabilities. And then back up top, we can even see queue drops, which are another good indicator of performance problems. If packets are being dropped, there's a good chance that the user is experiencing problems. So you can see it's really important that we look at each part of the network. We gather 288 points across many different metrics each day, or one per five minutes. We turn these 288 intervals into a series of daily statistics and then roll them up to monthly stats. This methodology of aggregating data, excuse me, this methodology of aggregate, aggregating data enables us to support many different use cases. Engineers want details, execs want summary data, and by providing a range of statistics on both the macro and micro level, as we'll see in the coming slides, we're able to create value across all the different users and consumers of our data. Users can start on a page like this with some initial investigation around these metrics by simply sorting all of the sites in decreasing order. This allows you to proactively look at the health of your network and determine where to drill down further. Looking at a macro view of the network in this way makes it possible to quickly identify problem areas or edges and be able to expand upon that. Speaking of such, we can then drill down into one edge. This visualization shows just one edge's details um, kind of blown up. And so overall, it looks mostly OK. We can see that there are some spikes in both of the links utilizations that go above 90% utilized. A high utilization is not necessarily a bad thing. It just means we need to look at other measurements to validate whether it's problematic. If we check the 95th percentile utilization statistics, which I'm pointing out over here, we see that these utilizations are also pretty high. But if we move on to the left, we can see that the absolute utilization is closer to only 50% utilized. This implies that the links are being utilized at a high capacity for only portions of the day. We could be working with a retail customer whose circuits are only dealing with heavy traffic during business hours, or another site that's only seeing traffic peaks during specific parts of the day. Another important indicator of network health is checking for CPU and memory stability. As we see on the bottom right, both CPU and memory for this edge have remained fairly stable throughout the past year. Likewise, another thing we can look see from this slide is that the utilization of the two links are very consistent with the other. This implies that the business policies are doing a good job at distributing the load. Right. On the other hand, here's another edge we can look at. This site shows a few different issues that I want to call attention to. As we see in the second link, the maximum utilization is over 100%. This shouldn't be possible. This likely means that the speed of the link is not appropriately configured. Maybe the link speed was increased at some point and the configuration was never changed. Also, if we look, across, look at the traffic across the different links, you see that that second one is overloaded, while the other ones are really lightly loaded. Maybe that's OK if one is a mobile link and you're trying to drive most of the traffic to the higher speed wired links. But outside of that, the business policies in place may not be effective. Maybe you're forcing traffic onto one link and you should consider using auto steering to let the edge effectively load share. Another good indicator of performance is the quality of experience score, or QOE. You can look at the network overall, as we see on the left, or you can drill down into one site, as we have on the right. 
QOE shows you how effective your network is performing when degradation or outage events happen. It's also easy to see how the QOE score can dip, as we see right here, when a circuit is lost. Lastly, QOE data, along with degradation and outage events, are a good way to derive the return on investment of the technology. Being able to show the overall stability of performance, even under individual link outage events, is a very powerful way to show the value of VMware SD-WAN to executives. The last metric I'd like to cover is applications. All too often, network architects and operators are unaware of the applications that get deployed on their network. Applications can often get added by IT, IT departments without the network team being engaged. Of course, when the performance issues occur, like we've said before, the network is often blamed. We recently worked with a customer that had performance issues in several of their flagship stores. We were able to quickly look at the network and discovered a video surveillance app on the network at those sites. Looking at the historical data, we were even able to identify when the applications were added. The applications were taking up over 90% of the edges capabilities, hence why the stores had been experiencing performance issues. So sometimes, looking for these anomalies is a way to more quickly discover unknown apps being added. The solution could be the need for more bandwidth or maybe a new business policy to appropriately treat this application with minimum impact on some more mission critical applications. Now my colleague Adam is going to dive a little bit deeper on how we access this data and the architecture that helps transform this data into something consumable. Thank you so much, Lily. And thank you for taking on Thank you for taking us on that journey through all of that awesome data. Um, so, uh, what I'm going to cover here now is how we collect data. <clears throat> Everything that we do from collection and transformation starts with the orchestrator APIs. Um, these APIs have dozens if not hundreds of endpoints that cover everything from uh, configuration to monitoring to diagnostics. Uh, we primarily obviously use them for data collection in our group. Uh, you most likely use the UI for most of what you do for configuring, managing, and monitoring your network. Um, but in using the, the UI, you are also consumers of the API. Uh, because everything that the, the UI does, it does through API calls. Um, and we can't foresee everything that you might need to do. So the, the UI isn't always sufficient. Um, and by having a strong API, it, enab it enables you to create your own custom workflows, your own automations that take care of the business cases that you care about. In the end, you're going to be able to do things that we never even think about or dream of. So a little bit on our data pipeline. Um, now, this is, this is what we do, right? And, and we operate at probably a different scale than, than most of you will for data collection and things like that. Um, still not necessarily to the point of uh, what I would say big data, but um, this is a reference. This isn't necessarily what you are going to do. Uh, everything that we do, as I mentioned, starts with the orchestrator. But uh, where we start, where, where, where we actually do is we create a collector. This collector um, does a series of API calls against the orchestrator. This collector is meant to do minimal work there. It's meant to just collect the data and send it to our caching layer. And so it does very little as far as processing the information. Uh, this collector is written in Python, containerized, and put in, in uh, AWS to run. We also have on-prem versions. So we can actually give you a version of the collector if you have an on-prem orchestrator, where you can run that and send us data without us having to have a login to your orchestrator. Um, in the end, it could be really be run anywhere. It doesn't matter. Uh, the next piece is what we call our, our cache API. Uh, this, is a, this is, again, written in Python, built on the Fast API framework. Uh, again, containerized and hosted in AWS. This one does a bit more work. What it does is it looks at all the data coming in and validates that the models and everything conform to what we expect it to. This allows us to kind of uh, get rid of some of the unknowns later on in the process. 
Uh, but it takes all of this raw data and stores it as JSON files in S3. And that's the next piece you see here, the, the JSON file cache, just an S3 bucket, nothing, nothing too terribly interesting there. Uh, from there, what we have is our ETL pipeline. For those who don't know, that is extract, transform, and load. So it's going to extract all this data from our S3 cache. It's going to transform it and then load it into our database. Uh, so it's going to take all the raw data calls, create objects out of those so that we see orchestrators and customers and partners. And then it's going to uh, create the metrics that we saw in Lily's slides earlier. All the daily and monthly data is created out of five minute statistics that we get raw. Um, it's also going to add our, our customer insights, right? So it's going to go out to another service and look up uh, what is the customer's size. Uh, how, many, how many employees does it have? How many, you know, what's the revenue on it? Um, there's lots of different services that do that. And we just happen to have one that we use that, that we like. Um, so uh, again, all this is written in Python, run in, in AWS. Oh, thank you, Lily. I was wondering why my notes were wrong. <laughs> uh, um, so. Uh, as far as databases go, uh, we, we picked Postgres uh, largely because it supports UUID, UUIDs as a native format, and we use a lot of those. Um, we also had some familiar, familiarity with it, um, and in particular, SQL in general. Uh, what you use is entirely up to what you and your organization needs and what you're familiar with. It could be Postgres, it could be anything NoSQL like, like Mongo, really just depends, it's dealer's choice. Uh, from there, we move on to consumption. Uh, for us, uh, you know, we have a couple of visualization tools that we use, Tableau and Power BI. Um, but we also have several Python programs that we use uh, to proactively communicate with you. So this is uh, sort of a snapshot. Why are you doing that? So this is a little bit of a snapshot of our, our database schema. It's not every single table, um, but it's most of them. And it's organized pretty well. Uh, so at the, uh, at the left there, you'll see the orchestrator. Um, all of these are concepts from the orchestrator. So a partner uh, is literally a partner that you'd see in the orchestrator that most of you probably have logins to. And then uh, customers, which again, you'll see those in the orchestrator, and finally edges. Uh, you'll see that most of our data is centered around edges, um, and that's just because it's kind of the backbone and core of our service. Uh, this data is sort of naturally hierarchical, right? Starts from the orchestrator and moves down through each of these levels. This allows us to sort of do filtering in either direction. So we can start, you know, your salesperson can start with a serial number and see which customer it's activated under. Uh, or our CEMs can go through all of your edges, or you know, if you're a partner, go through all of them, or a customer, go through all of them, and uh, look for inconsistencies in version or configuration, or even recommend upgrades based on seeing old versions, things like that. Uh, as far as visualizations, visualization tools go, um, we ended up primarily using Power BI as our visualization tool. Uh, this isn't necessarily a plug for them. Uh, but they, uh, they handle tabular data and lots of filters really well. And that was important to us because we wanted to enable the internal consumers of our system uh, access to the raw, almost, the, almost raw data. Um, and again, you can use any BI system. Uh, Tableau, Power BI, Click, Soho, doesn't really matter. Um, really, it's just important that you have that system in place to enable those people in your organization to manipulate, view, and extract data. Um, because again, they're going to have workflows that you don't foresee. Um, so this has also enabled us to do some quick POCs, some uh, proofs, proofs of concept, uh, by, again, enabling teams that aren't us, we're a limited resource, to go through and extract data and do their own things in Excel or other programs. 
Uh, for instance, my boss right here, Tom, uh, has uh, been working on a risk score lately, attempting to quantify the risk of any given customer based on configuration, uh, how many times they've upgraded, things along those lines. Uh, he exported data, put it all in Excel, and was able to create formulas that gave us this quantifiable risk score. And he was able to apply domain knowledge and the domain knowledge of our team to do that. Um, our, our larger team actually has a bunch of network engineers who are even, you know, who uh, have a really good grasp on, on what problems you're likely to run into. So um, then, in the coming weeks, we're going to try and codify that in actual code. We're going to take that and write, write a program to actually store that in our database back with all the rest of our data. So now we're going to move on to how you benefit from this data today. Um, really, this is, this is through what we call a series of low-touch customer success programs. Um, and it's, it's customer success because it's meant to uh, really make your uh, experience with the platform better, thus uh, be more successful with it. And it's low-touch because uh, we don't have to do anything individually for every partner or customer. Uh, so think of it sort of like uh, Netflix, if you're not familiar with customer success, right? You might get an email saying, uh, hey, there's this new series. It's a lot like some of the other series you've watched. You might enjoy it, right? It's meant to be that sort of same thing where it kind of draws you back into the platform and uh, allows you to, you know, to enjoy it more. Um, one of the more public uses of our data is what we call the recommended version. Um, in this, we use, among other inputs, uh, how widely deployed or adopted a given version is. Uh, the goal here is to ensure that the version is widely deployed across a variety of customers and thus likely configs. Um, when we combine that with uh, looking into our ticketing system and, and uh, making sure there's no escalations or high priority issues open, uh, it gives us the ability to recommend a version that we think uh, is likely but not guaranteed to not have issues when you upgrade. Because uh, we just, we can't guarantee it, right? Every config is slightly different. Sometimes you just run into things. Some of our other low-touch customer success initiatives um, that rely on the data we collect, uh, the first is going to be uh, MINS. Now, uh, a bunch of you had, had uh, raised your hands as having uh, used SASE before. How many of you have gotten our maintenance emails about upgrades or things that our customers have, or our edge ops group is doing? This is where those come from, right? Our database, our data. Uh, now, edge ops is responsible for doing the day-to-day -day on that, right? Entering, hey, we're doing this maintenance here. We've started this maintenance. We've stopped this maintenance. Um, but really, it's, a, it's around uh, telling you about upgrades or uh, capacity planning or gateway migrations and making sure that everyone's on the same page as far as when we do things to our infrastructure. The next is uh, pins. Again, this is probably emails that you've gotten uh, that say, hey, here's a knowledge base article. You might be affected by this. And this is run by our support group. Um, and what they do is when we get a, uh, an issue or a bug reported to us, they will fingerprint that bug alongside engineering and go, these are the features that, uh, this, that having these configured in this way uh, is going to make you likely to run into this bug if you're on a version that's not fixed. So what we do is we, take, we create a knowledge base article for that that includes which versions it's fixed in, which, uh, which features or how that bug presents itself, and any workarounds that might be in place where you can uh, resolve it without necessarily an upgrade. We then take that knowledge base article, we go through our database, and we look for anybody who's using those features or that combination of features. And uh, we then send out emails with this knowledge base article to you to say, hey, you could run into this. And the goal here is to reduce the frustration. Um, how many of you have called into support, talked about your issue for two or three days, and then they say, oh yeah, that's a known issue, that's a bug. Probably several of you, <laughs> yeah, got a couple nods in there. Um, this is meant to reduce that frustration, right? Like, think about you know, your troubleshooting, you're into day two of troubleshooting, and uh, 
you get an email saying, hey, there's this bug you might be affected by. You open it up and you're like, yeah, that's, that's the bug I'm running into. Like, that'd be great. Like, it's, it's save, the, the idea is to save you time and frustration. Um, from there, what we have is what we call monthly recommendations. And this is, uh, this is actually really run by, by our team uh, in conjunction with our, our partner architects. And the goal of this is to look at your config and look at the events that have happened on your network and try and raise those up in, uh, into an email so that uh, you know when you're breaking best practice. So for instance, you might have a hub configured with dynamic bandwidth. And this can be bad because it can, do, it, it can degrade the, the service between your hub and your edges as it's constantly trying to measure bandwidth and figure out how much bandwidth it has. Um, it can also figure out it doesn't have enough bandwidth and then uh, use less of the link than it should. Uh, or we could be looking at events and we could see that it's got a bunch of kernel panics or maybe it's got some service crashes that have happened uh, over the last month. And we want to raise those up because you may not be looking at those every day in the orchestrator. We want to be able to tell you about those. Uh, and we, again, we want these to be actionable. We want, these to, we want you to get these emails and go, yeah, okay, there's a problem here. And this is just a few of the ways that we use this data. Again, these are, these are again, more public things that, that directly affect you and what you do. Um, all of our teams use this data. Uh, those of you who are, are some of the larger partners will have salespeople or CEMs that use this data and actually give you uh, views into this data. While they may not give you the, the whole thing, they can at least give you some of it. Um, moving on to something we've been working on and sort of a, an aspirational project is uh, some AI ops work. And, you know, this is, oh, I don't know why it's doing that. There we go. Um, so uh, the goal here is really just to, to give another data point to help answer the question of when will my edge or my links need to be upgraded? Uh, sort of that trend analysis of, look, you know, you're growing 20% year over year, you're going to overrun your capacity, you know, probably in six months or 18 months, who knows. Um, part of that is also doing anomaly detection, as Lily brought up with the applications, like, hey, this is abnormal for your network, right? Normally you're at, you know, 20 megabits a, a average, and this month you're at 30. That's kind of weird. Um, but really just, just trying to draw as much as we can with the data and get that into your hands and you know, in ways that we can. Again, this is aspirational. We don't necessarily have anything today on it, but it's definitely stuff that's in the pipeline that we're working on. So some of the, the key takeaways, what we hope you leave here today with is an understanding that the orchestrator APIs are really robust and that they can and should be utilized to drive value in your organization through enabling data collection. And while we didn't deep dive into, today, into it today, customization and automation of your workflows. Along with that, there's a lot of really great analysis and visualization that can be done with the data from the APIs. We've developed a database and used different BI tools to be able to pull insights. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lily. That's OK. There we go. We've developed a database <laughs> and used different BI tools to be able to pull insights and create trends. And as Adam mentioned, we are also working towards predictive analytics. And finally, we hope that uh, you're already getting value from the APIs through the various low-touch customer success things we're doing. Um, yeah, that's really about it. Uh, we've got plenty of time for Q&A, so anybody want to go first? Oh, yeah, our LinkedIn's there if you care to connect. Go for it. Uh, if you don't mind here, just please. walking up to the mic so it'll be recorded for everyone, or we'll repeat it. Sure. Okay. Uh, first of all, yeah, excellent presentation. It's uh, you know, some great insights in there. Quick question just around edge availability. Is that something that you've looked at as part of this analysis? It's you know, clients that come from traditional networks, that's the report they get from their network provider every month. and. It's not something that's natively in the product at the moment. Is that something that you've looked at as part of this analysis? It is not. Um, 
The, the most granular data that we can get is five minute data. And I don't know if that would necessarily be practical for calculating that. Um, so it's not something we're looking at today. Good afternoon. Afternoon. This is weird. <laughs> <laughs> does, does this one work? I don't Sorry, think it works. Back there. Uh, so this is, this is fantastic. Uh, we've been using this since, I would call it pre-alpha. I don't know what that would be. We've been using it for about seven years now. Yeah. Uh, to address the problems that you were actually talking about, right? Because as the, the networks get larger, right, the amount of data you have to sift through makes it unbearable. So, yep. you know, some of the things that, that we've been able to do for our customers are just high-level dashboards, right? Um, which, you know, which edges are using the most capacity, which are using the least, right? Which is another thing the customers are looking for is they, mm -hmm. they want to right-size their bandwidth. So yep. if they're not using very much, they want to change the bandwidth out. Uh, also with the applications, it was huge. I called it the uh, Pokemon Go killer. Right? <laughs> because uh, you see these things both popping up on your network mm -hmm. and you don't know they're there. So you know, like a new application report over the last you know, 30, 60, 90 days uh, was really powerful. And then just the, the ability to do more reporting we had one customer who's a, a very large chain, 600 locations, they were doing a, a Meraki migration project, right? So they wanted to know how many of their sites still had Meraki in it. And somehow they couldn't use the Meraki dashboard, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> so we were able to get them a view across their entire network, right? How many, how many APs were still deployed, if they were online, uh, how much traffic they were passing, so they're still you know, being yeah. used. And so it's, it's a tremendous tool, and I, I'm really happy to see that you guys have, have matured it. It's, uh, and it's a double-edged sword, right? Because as a service provider, I like that you know we can do that. Uh, yeah. But it's it's great that you're doing this uh, and exposing us. Yeah. Very powerful. Thanks. And that's something that you can still take ownership over. As Adam mentioned, these APIs are already available and readily accessible for anyone who's one of our service users. Yeah. I mean, just to reiterate, anything we anything we do through the UI, anything we do in the product, you can also do. It's every every API is there. It's documented. No, not all of them are documented. Most of them are documented. <laughs> <laughs> Almost all of them are documented. But it's all there. It's all there to be used. All there, you know, it's got schemas on the data that comes back, all those types of things. Anybody else got questions? And sorry, if you would, go ahead and introduce yourself as well. Oh, hey, uh, my name is Austin. I'm with CRCC. I work in plant services. I mean, we've been using ValCloud for about five years now, yeah. since it was you know, still by an independent company. Uh, but my question is for customers who have an on-prem solution where we manage our own orchestrator and mm -hmm. gateways, do you guys also gonna have a way to have that monthly patch notes or the risk assessments? Yeah, we, How would we get notified? We security? absolutely do. We have, we have two ways that we can pull data from your system. Um, either you can give us an API token and a URL for where we hit that orchestrator, um, or uh, we can actually give you the collection script and a series of variables and an API token, and you can like set up a, a schedule to run our script and send that data to us. And then that allows us to include you on all of the emails and everything. Oh, that's great. I'll have to look into that. Thank yeah. you. Uh, do you have a salesperson or a CEM? Uh, yeah, we do. Okay. Um, Just yeah. get with them. They can get you in touch with us. Great. Or, or talk to Tom right here. He'll. Anyone else? Going once, going twice, going three times. We have to be here until at least 45. So if anyone wants to talk to us separately, <laughs> we're not going anywhere. But thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, please take your survey. We'd really appreciate it. And again, really excited about this data we're working on. And, and we're also happy to answer questions separately. So yes. Feel free to catch us afterwards.